So uh, welcome back, everybody. I am here with Father Brendan Kilcoyne of Immaculata Productions, and it's great to speak to you today, Father. Thank you very much, Ben. It's an absolute pleasure to be with you. So uh, you're obviously involved with Immaculata Productions, making these weekly theological videos, and uh, I was really taken aback when I first discovered it by the sort of shock value marketing uh, approach that you guys seem to have taken. Like uh, for the St. Patrick's Day video, you start by saying that you want St. Patrick's Day to be banned, which is something that you wouldn't expect. You know, it sort of makes you sit up and think, where, where yeah. is this going? Or uh, you, you had a clip entitled, uh, you're a scumbag and you're going to die. And then obviously you go on to explain what you mean by that and it's much more reasonable, but it sort of pops the whole approach. And it's very different to the sort of pedestrian, more lackluster approach to religion that I think a lot of people take and a lot of people expect. And so I'm wondering what made you settle on that style? I think the 19th century uh, Catholic novelist Canon Sheehan put it best in one of his novels where he said that the Catholic Church was um, the wealthiest merchant in the world and the worst of, of shopkeepers. Uh, we're not good at selling what we have, but what we have is, is absolutely incredible. And it was the frustration coming out of that, out of realizing um, what a bad job we were doing. Now, Sometimes, you know, when we get frustrated with the modern world, believers will say, well, they don't listen to us, they twist our words. Um, I think probably people in a lot of walks of life have that experience in dealing with the media in such a frantic industry, in fairness. I'm not saying that there isn't some of that. I think there probably is. But I, I think a far bigger problem is simply getting attention. And even before you do that is actually thinking out new ways of telling the same story. Now, I was a teacher. Uh, I was a school chaplain and teacher and school principal, and any experienced teacher will tell you that a huge part of teaching is repeating the same things year after year and trying to find ever better ways of doing it. Mm? And um, I, I think that's... I think what we have in the church, to be honest, is, is to a large extent, it's a, it's a crisis of second level education. Um, and I don't just mean by that that, that our, our second level catechesis is poor. It's absolutely dire. It has been since the 70s. Um, we, we really have made a hash at that level. And it's, a, it's in adolescence that we lose, the, we lose our, our people. But um, I, I, I don't just mean that. I mean, I mean it in terms of we're not able to really do well what the French call high vulgarization. To take complex ideas, which is the teacher's genius, take complex ideas and render them into very vivid um, uh, images and contradictions and paradoxes and to tease the mind and get people thinking. We used to be good at it. I, just at this point, we're not. And it, it's, it's infuriating because we're in a society, a civilization which is without precedent. Um, communications are, are, they have become so democratized in many ways. Now, I know there's manipulation and there are there are serious questions to be asked as to, as to the small number of people who control huge amounts of that, of that world now. But um, I'm quite sure that those will be addressed, those problems, and they are being addressed. In the meantime, we have to get better at doing what needs to be done, which is articulating the faith to a new generation. I was very interested in one comment you made about, uh, you know, readings in mass about these, as you put it, blood curdling chapters in yes. the Bible that, yeah. they, you know, when you read these stories, it, it you know, you could make a Hollywood movie out of it. It's, you know, the Old Testament stories about tribes warring in the desert. It's yes. like something out of Mad Max almost. That's right. And they're very action-packed, and yet it seems like uh, very often if you attend uh, service in Mass, the way it's presented is incredibly dull, for lack of a better word. I don't, don't want to be disparaging of people, but that's just the truth of the matter. And I guess, you know, what do you think of the passion with which these things are delivered? One of the great achievements in oratory, or it used to be, was where you got to the point of actually mastering 
how to speak in public the way you speak in private. Because people, have, people do not realise how constrained they are by their own lack of confidence and by fear when they stand up to speak. And so they, they start to become far too polite. Their diction becomes too good. Now you do need diction, but, but their diction becomes too good. And it's, and it's clearly somebody, as it were, dressed in their oratorical Sunday best. And so somebody who could tell you a story in the pub that would probably leave you stuck to the seat with fascination. You, you'd forget your pint. They go up and they do a reading in the church on Sunday and they send half the church to sleep. You know? Um, and, and part of the problem is they go up and they talk nice. They go, they, now, am I asking them to go up and turn the whole thing into a circus act? I'm not. But I think it's a mistake to despise the circus. I, I really do. I, I think we need to start studying drama again. Uh, we need, and I say again because it used to be done. Rhetoric was a major subject in classical education and church education. Uh, there was a whole house in Manute simply called rhetoric. The, the, the actual building was called rhetoric because that was what you studied in that year if you were living there. Um, how to communicate in words, how to communicate on paper, in print, uh, uh, in, in, in cyberspace, but also how to speak. And more and more nowadays how to speak in front of, in front of a, a camera. In church you'll be speaking in front of increasingly decreasing crowds. <laughs> yeah, but still, uh, it is public speaking. If somebody would go up and read the way they talk, they'd have the church wrapped. Um, what is the long-term goal of Immaculata Productions? If in you know five years or ten years the progress is made and you guys have gained more and more of a following, where would you like to see the media outlet go and what would you want to do with it? We're only starting to articulate that now and to, and to plan it with the help of, of a friend of ours who has a background in that area. In terms, he, He's an engineer, but he's a background in sales as well. Um, and so I'd say what we'll, what we'll be planning is, is to set a goal in terms of subscription numbers, uh, as pretty much everyone else does. Um, and I'm not confusing that with making a genuine contact, but I think we have to expand our base if we hope to make a real difference. Uh, we have, we have a, a modest, loyal following. Yeah, it's slowly growing. There's nothing wrong with that. I, th I think we need to speed it up just a bit. We need to get moving just, just a bit faster. But I have every confidence that we'll get there. I, I do, and, I think, and I, think, I think we will make a contribution. It's pretty clear now that Ireland is not a Christian country anymore, and uh, this year is obviously a census year, and there's been this push recently from secular anti-theists uh, urging people that if they aren't Catholic, not to put Catholic down on the census. What, what do you think of that? I think I, I do have sympathy with them in that uh, we're um, one, of the, one of the things we find very difficult in terms of pastoral work are the numbers of people asking for the sacraments who don't believe. And what they're doing is they're using the sacraments. And I don't mean that they're not good people. I mean, they're using the sacraments uh, to provide uh, social rites of passage. Now, uh, it's time for them to make the, the, the horrible decision you know, if you're brought up in something, that you have to start from scratch again. But if you don't believe in it, that's where you are. And there really is no point wishing you were somewhere else. It's like that old Irish, Irish bull, wasn't it? The Irish joke where somebody asks the way to somewhere and, and they're told, well, if I were you, I wouldn't be starting from here. <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, fine, you see the point, but at the same time, it's not very helpful. You start from where you are. And I, I think the census obviously needs to become ever more flexible, ever more responsive and reflective. So I think, for instance, if they had, if they had a, a line for heritage and then a line for current conviction and practice, that would tell us a lot. Ask, you see, you're only asking for trouble where, you only, where, where the thing is too crude and people, all people can do is, is just answer one question. You're asking too much of them, because in saying they're not Catholic, you're asking them, they may feel to renounce their heritage, their childhood, what their parents gave them, 
uh, most people have that secular pietas left, you know, that reverence for what they came from, to some extent. At least, um, it would be better to give them more of a choice and to get a true reflection of the picture. Do you think that Irish culture and Christianity are separable? No. One way or another, they have become separated, or they're in the process of being separated. And the process is quite, is quite far advanced. I think what Ireland is starting to do now is pretty much what the rest of Western Europe has been doing, um, which is living on the, it's a, it's a kind of St. Stephen's Day or Boxing Day menu. They're living on the heated leftovers of uh, the feast. Um, I don't know how long that'll last. I suspect no more than a few generations. Um, I think we're coming into a neo-pagan uh, period. I'm not using that term abusively. Um, I, I just can't think of a different term at the moment. Yeah, I, don't, I don't want actually to, to be thought that I'm being abusive there. I'm just trying to describe what's happening. Pagans have gods. And people are kneeling to things, they just don't know it. The cult of celebrity is basically, they, they, the cult of celebrity is basically, uh, the, it's the dregs of the religious instinct. Uh, I mean, the Caesars called themselves gods, uh, openly. <laughs> yeah, there was a cult of the emperor. Uh, the, so the cult of celebrities, uh, sport, in a whole load of ways, organized religion continues under different guises. And in strange, with no mention of God, in strange, crippled ways, but it, but it, it, it continues. Um, will Ireland, well, it won't, be the, it won't be the Ireland that has been up to now. That's the best I can say to you. Maybe they should change the name of the place. I don't know, but uh, certainly it was very wrapped up with Catholicism in the past. So what we're talking about now is a completely different way of being Irish. Um, it's very curious to me that we see things like in America, we don't really have it here in Ireland, but there'll be these signs that people put on their lawns and it'll be a whole long list of left-wing convictions politically. It'll be, you know, uh, trans women are women and uh, no person is illegal and so on and so forth. And it's basically like a secular political creed these yes. are the beliefs yes. that you have to yes. hold and it's very similar to the catholic creed yes. or any other religion that has a format like that and you even have things like you know certain forms of therapy are almost taking the place of where confession sure. used to fulfill yeah. that we are seeing a weird religious instinct emerging where people have nominally abandoned their faith but they've just replaced it with something very similar uh, yes. at the same time yeah. See, we tend to forget that things like yoga, which the Indian priests keep reminding us, things like yoga are a part of a huge, incredibly complex religious civilization. And, but we, we're getting a bit of religion um, pasteurized, um, thinned down, <laughs> uh, bland beyond belief. But there still is a bit of religion left in it. And, and, and people can sense that it's there, I think. Now, an atheist would probably rubbish what I'm saying. I, I don't think anthropologically I'm 100 miles off. I think this stuff just goes underground, you know, and, and I think that's what's happening. So I don't know, up to now, I don't know if you could have been Irish without being Christian. There were probably two ways of doing it, putting it very coarsely Catholic or Protestant. But up to now, I don't know if you could have been. Now, being Irish, and this is quite frightening for everybody. Now being Irish is actually something completely new. And I don't know what that is. And I'm not sure that the people who seem so sure as to what it is really do know what it is. They couldn't. It's too new. Um, I mean, a lot of it seems to be wanting to be very uh, cosmopolitan and... Yes. The, it, I, I'm sure you've noticed that it seems like almost every capital city in the world is more and more starting to resemble every other capital city and that there's sort of just a homogenized global culture where we all watch the same things on yes. Netflix, we all listen to the same types yes. of music, we all eat at the same McDonald's. I mean, you can see uh, the pyramids of Giza from a pizza hut, you know, this kind yeah. of thing. Like, And so um, what it is to be Irish is almost vanishing as well. Yes. And I think there's a lot of people who are actually kind of happy about that, that they, they, sure. they view it as an accomplishment the more we resemble 
Brussels or Paris or Berlin. Well, Douglas Hyde, well over 100 years ago, wasn't it? He who called us the Japanese of Western Europe because the Japanese at the time were the marvel of the world in terms of appropriating, imitating and producing more cheaply the technology of the West. Um, and um, he, he was shaking his head over it because he felt that, like the Japanese, we stood to lose an inestimable culture. Uh, of our of our own, and I think he was right to sense that vulnerability, you know. And I I, I think you're I think you're absolutely right about that. It's kind of like um, it's kind of as if the future is is sort of run by Burger King, McDonald's, all of this, um, uh, fine in its way, but sanitized, bland, safe. You see, real culture, like real community, is not safe. The trouble, everyone goes on about wanting community, but community is quite controlling. People forget how controlling the old peasant cultures were. They're very controlling. The aristocratic cultures control their members. The middle class cultures. Pierce joked about it. He said, thou shalt not carry a brown paper parcel, yet lest thou shock Rathgar. You know, because a gentleman at the time could not be seen. It was the work of a servant. You couldn't be seen to carry parcels. Um, I, I think we tend to forget that a, a, a real culture hurts sometimes. It's, it's quite dangerous in ways, and people want to be safe. But the price of that, Anthony Bourdain, the TV chef who, who so tragically died there a few years ago, a tremendous communicator of, of, of that whole world of, of cuisine and cooking, he once said that the price of fine cuisine I think it was he who said it. The price of fine cuisine was, okay, was the occasional night hitting the porcelain. <laughs> in other words, I mean, I think he recommended the chicken be eaten slightly pink, uh, as indeed I think the French do, and they take a chance on it. Um, real culture is not pasteurized. It's dangerous. And, and, and they're right, people are right to be aware of that danger. As uh, You know, I mean... Uh, as Pierce talked about, you know, the, the, the East arising, the terrible beauty. It, it is beautiful and terrible. They, they're right about that. You see it in the Ukraine now. You see it in different places. But I think there has to be, I don't know, a better way of doing it than the way we're doing it. You know, you don't solve anything simply by some form of, of cultural roundup that you spray on everything, so that everything is green and everything is uniform, you know? Uh, culture contains real weeds. <laughs> and uh, it seems like, I mean, the, the enemy today in our modern society is shame. You hear all, of, all the time about uh, fat shaming or yes. slut shaming or whatever it might be, and that the idea of, uh, you know, somebody being made to feel bad yes. for any behavior, even yes. if it is something that is morally objectionable or it's bad for them or whatever it might be, that's seen as totally unacceptable. That's like the only sin now in modern society is making somebody feel bad for almost anything they've done. And I think, you know, adding on to what you've said about how culture, if we want to abide by the same values, we want to have a cohesive society where we can all get along, there is a twinge of, you know, th there needs to be a standard by which you can say, now, well, actually, that's not an appropriate way to conduct yourself. You know, this isn't the way we want people in our society to behave. And that might feel bad to be the, on the receiving end of that. But it's the way that we can enforce moral norms. And people don't want that. They want to live in a nice society, but they want anyone to be able to do anything they want at any time. And I don't know if those two ideas are really compatible. They don't. But we're masters in the West at, at uh, killing the chicken uh, with no blood on our hands afterwards. We've become masters at it. Human beings are killers. History teaches us that again and again and again. The West has perfected uh, the, the, the human tendency to kill anything that gets in its way uh, through euphemism, through, uh, a, to, uh, let's, for instance, the abortion industry, through a, a superb medical culture which can efficiently deal with things and hide things. Uh, we're not going to have any 
tomb babies in this culture, they won't even get born. The unwanted won't get born. Um, so there's a really dark side to this, this culture roundup, as I called it, this, this spraying of the crops that is with shame, with shame and, and, and a whole lot of things, but it, it, they're not written laws and the whole thing looks very democratic. But in fact, the media uh, are acting very much as the agents of this. They are the priests of this new religion. What would you say to people who claim that Ireland is better off now that it's a secular country than it was back when we were religious? Swings and roundabouts. In some ways, it's a nicer country. There's no doubt about that. I think people are kinder. I noticed it when I was uh, running a school. The kids were getting gentler. They were getting kinder. I, do, I, do, I don't question that that has happened. Um, I question how deep it goes, not because they're evil people, but because they're people because we're human. And I point out that we killed nearly 7,000 kids last year in this country, right? I don't know any other way to put this. <laughs> and and, and they, they, they certainly weren't all instances in which the life of the mother was threatened or, or any of the other hard cases you can think of. Most of them were lifestyle choices, yeah? Or, or at least to get rid of, of socially unacceptable consequences. Um, but it's there. Definitely, at, at at least a superficial level, and superficial kindness is not nothing. You know, good manners are not nothing. Um, I, I, do, I do think we're probably gentler, but I think we've just become better killers, more assured. I, I think people who, re, who take this Whig or liberal view of history as one line of continuous development and ascent are for the birds. They don't know anything about people. <laughs> they, 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 it's, it's, it's not that simple. The line of ascent really is technological. You know, it's technological. Um, in terms of human nature, it's not clear it has changed at all. Nor could it. I mean, even if you take a completely Darwinian approach to this, and I'm far from an expert on it, but let's, let's say you did. My understanding is, is that changes take long, long periods of time. DNA doesn't change so quickly. It's remarkable when you look at crises throughout the world, how quickly totally civilized, normal populations can re return to absolute barbarism if there's, say, a food right. shortage or That's at the right. slightest. It's, it's like a, a meniscus or a veneer over yes. every one of us where we have no idea what we'd be capable of if we were up in the Andes and we were forced to eat another person yes. or something crazy like this. That That's all within us. And I think a lot of people don't necessarily realize that or appreciate yeah. that, that um, civilization, as much as it's a habit, uh, Herodotus has said that, you know, we have the habit of civilization. Um, it, it is also something, there's something much deeper ingrained in us, which is um, to be uncivilized and to be actually quite callous and cruel. And that can come out as well. Yeah. And, and I, I think we're constantly... Um we're reinterpreting our own myths, creating new ones. Uh, it's very effective. And it, it uh, diminishes uh, complexity. It pays lip service to complexity because people must be made to feel that they're highly educated and they're making decisions at every, <clears throat> at every stop and turn. But actually, it diminishes the complexity. It has to. Because, you know, to, the, the myths are great dramatic tellings. You know, they don't go into the nitty bitty and the, the detail, you know. Like, I, I'm, I'm sure, for instance, a lot of the people Ku Cullen killed, you know, they had wives and children. And, and Mike Myers is far better at, at going into the ludicrous <laughs> aspects of all of this. But um, uh, we're, we're, at, we're at that and, and it's constantly going on. It's going on on Netflix. It's going on in films. And sometimes it's almost as open as traditional Russian propaganda, which is anything but subtle. <laughs> but sometimes it's actually very good. The best of it is superb, but it is a retelling of, the, of our story. And I've no problem with that. If that's the story you want and believe, I have a huge problem with people thinking that they're making up their own mind when in fact their minds have been made up for them already. That's a problem. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, that's, that's the thing that a lot of people don't realize that uh, we're all 
susceptible to propaganda, you know, yes. every single one of us. And that w when you live in a world where information can be beamed directly into your phone, like you think about totalitarian regimes in history, I believe one of the first acts Adolf Hitler did when he became when he came to power was give every single person in Germany a radio. And you think, oh, wow, what a, what a generous, wonderful guy. It's so that the government line is now in the household of every yes. single person in the state. And now we all have a smartphone attached to us like an appendage and we're all checking it constantly. And I'd, I'd say even, even myself, yourself, everybody, we probably don't even realize how much of what we consume is being put in front of us specifically to elicit a certain response from us and so that we can change our opinion gradually over time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you see, the, what, what's going on at the moment is, is, is that, and I'm not saying it's a conspiracy, I, I, it may be just happening, I don't know. In, in a way, that's almost more frightening. Our free-range days may be over, you know? Uh, maybe modern society is simply too complex. Maybe this civilization we've created won't allow for the same degree of freedom. Perhaps uh, the freedoms I'm talking about really were restricted to a small part of the world anyway, and only for a limited amount of time. People tend to forget, they say, oh, well, uh, you know, Britain has been democratic for so long. It was democratic if you had a certain level of property. People forget this. It was democratic if you were male and had a certain level of property. You know, actually what we have is quite recent. And uh, I, don't, I don't know if it's going to last. Um, and I'm afraid that is worrying because even though the Catholic Church was, and let's state this, deeply suspicious of democracy <laughs> at every stop and turn, you know, for quite a long time. It reluctantly came around to the view through experience that perhaps democracy did present the best possible option going forward, simply looking at the tremendous crimes that were committed in the totalitarian society. Um, I, I, uh, I, w I would worry a lot at the, at the way things are going. The, there's, there's an excellent film from about 1970 called uh, The Rise and Rise of Michael Rimmer. You hardly ever hear it cited or referred to. I think it was written by, well, it was, John Cleese was one of them anyway, and I can't remember the other. John, John Cleese was one of them. The other guy was a noted uh, English comedian as well. But um, it, it talks about a man, a gray man, a bland man, who ends up, Prime Minister of England and ends up seizing total power. Uh, Grey and bland and unthreatening and affirming of everyone around him. And the way in which he does it is that he subjects people to endless plebiscites on the smallest issues of administration. He drives them absolutely crazy and they end up handing him enormous powers just to leave them alone. It's really worth looking at. Um, uh, John Cleese was definitely one of the writers, 1970. I would worry about that now. I think the whole thing has become so complicated and people are busy and they're tired and they're worried and their lives are very complicated and then you have natural human lethargy and all the rest of it. I feel we're, we're handing more and more authority uh, to the media uh, and the media serve, it, begins to look, they serve the state. It does begin to, to look like that, to be honest. Um, they say they don't, and they hold them accountable. They hold individual servants of the state accountable. I, I think they're quite on, on key with the drift of things. And, um, and they're very much a part of it. And I think we just can't be bothered. We just take the pap, the pabulum that we're being fed, um, and uh, I'm, I'm listening more and more now to very disagreeable and cranky podcasters and, and, uh, and, and vloggers, uh, because they're the only ones now who give you the unpasteurized version. They fight with everybody, if they're any good. Well, thank you so much, Father. Really appreciate it. Not at all. Uh, not at all. It's, it's a, I, I, I really have huge, huge respect for your work. 
and I take great hope from it. So it's, I'm very flattered to have, to have, to have been interviewed.